He attended the Saint Ignatius in the Saint Ignatius Institute at the University of San Francisco, where he majored in theology and minored in philosophy and German. He entered St. Patrick's Seminary in Menlo Park, California for one year, then completed his seminary formation at Pontifical North American College in Rome. He studied philosophy and liturgy at the University of Innsbruck. He earned three degrees, including a doctorate in sacred theology from the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome, where he is where he has also served as an adjunct faculty member, in Italian, by the way. Um, on June 23, 2001, he was ordained to the priesthood in the Archdiocese of San Francisco by Cardinal William Laveda. Uh, as a priest of the Archdiocese, he served as associate pastor in two parishes, and in 2005, he was named an official of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, uh, the Vatican office responsible for promoting and preserving Catholic teaching. For seven of his 10 plus years at the Vatican, he served as the secretary to the Cardinal Prefect. Uh, he was named Monsignor in 2010. Pope Francis named him the Bishop of the Personal Ordinariate of the Chair of St. Peter on November 24, 2015. His Episcopal motto, uh, so it's Latin phrase, Magna Opera Domini, uh, in English, great are the works of the Lord. Bishop Lopes, this may be my favorite part, Bishop Lopes is a chaplain of the Sovereign Military Hospitaller Order of St. John of Jerusalem of Rhodes and of Malta, and remains deeply committed to the Order of Malta's work serving the sick and the poor. Uh, ever committed to serving the people of the ordinary, his mission as a bishop is dedicated to inviting new disciples into a life-giving relationship with Christ, nurturing reverence and beauty in the liturgy so that the ordinary its tradition of worship deepens the faith and authentic discipleship of all of the faithful, modeling ecumenism, fostering the unity of the church that our Lord prayed in, prayed for in John 17, and serving in evangelical charity by caring for those in need. Please welcome Bishop Stephen Lopes. I apologize in advance for having broken the weather, apparently, by my visit here today. Uh, as, as Peter mentioned, and as Archbishop said before, I am Bishop of the Ordinariate of the Chair of St. Peter, which immediately you know that no one who had anything to do with marketing had anything to do with our name. <laughs> the Ordinariate of the Chair of St. Peter is a non-territorial diocese. There are three of these. Uh, uh, these ordinariates that are, are, are erected in the world to care for uh, congregations, clergy, and faithful who are formerly Anglican, who have come into full communion with the Catholic Church, preserving some of their uh, Anglican history, patrimony, liturgy, uh, theology, and, and to bring that to bear to the fullness of life in the Catholic Church. It, in that sense, uh, gives concrete expression to the ecumenical vision both of Pope John Paul II and Pope Benedict XVI. And that's kind of what I want to talk a little bit about today, what that ecumenical vision was. The history of, of, this, uh, of Anglican ministers, who are mostly married men, seeking to become Catholic priests actually is, um, is not a recent phenomenon. The first pope to grant a dispensation to one of these ministers to be ordained as a married Catholic priest was Pope Pius XII. Pope John Paul II, following a, a, a movement of this uh, after the Second Vatican Council, comes up with a codified way for this to happen. It's called the pastoral provision, and that he, he promulgates in 1982. It's a method for which Anglican clergy and congregations can seek to enter the Catholic Church, still as individuals, um, but that there is a pathway even to ordination and a way that, uh, that the church, the Catholic Church, can acknowledge in the lives and ministry of these, uh, of these Anglican clergy that there is the working of the Holy Spirit, that there is spiritual fruitfulness and pastoral fruitfulness, and that can be measured. Mm -hmm. And that is what motivates the, the dispensation uh, from the norm of the Church of Clerical Celibacy to allow that man to continue that work in that community now as a Catholic priest. So from 1982 to about 2005, there are about 90 such married clergy 
uh, ordained as Catholic priests in the United States. In England, that number is somewhere around 700 in, in about the same, same period. So, uh, but in the United States, about 90. They remained priests of their individual diocese. You don't know if you've had anyone here in Oklahoma City. More common in Texas and in some of the other, uh, in some of the other dioceses. Um, and they brought together, oh, it, the number fluctuated between three and nine, and let's say seven, uh, seven parish communities that were formerly Anglican, who have become Catholic with their priest, and together they were given uh, um, the ability, the possibility from Rome of celebrating a liturgy, a mass, that was reminiscent of what they would have known and celebrated uh, as Episcopalians or as Anglicans. But it was still kind of very sporadic. Those were parishes of the diocese um, at where they were located. There was one in Houston, one in San Antonio, Kansas City, Boston, Fort Worth, you know, this kind of thing. And really, those parishes didn't have anything to do with each other. It was, it was very much of a local phenomenon, much like you would have now uh, a parish. I, I know there's one here in, in town uh, for the traditional Latin mass, uh, for the extraordinary form kind of a thing. That remains a parish of the diocese administered in a certain way. That's what the, those things were like. It was still very much a sense of, of trying to make a pastoral accommodation for these people, but still, you know, um, a very, very individual thing. So that when a community came together, each individual person was going through RCIA and as was the priest. And then, you know, he would be sent off the seminary and what that formation would look like was dependent on the bishop. It was all still kind of an individual thing. The question shifts in 2007. And that year, several Anglican and Episcopalian bishops from England, United States, Canada, and Australia approached the Holy See uh, asking the question differently. We're ready to be Catholic. You see, there's always been that Catholic root in Anglicanism. And it pushes at various points during history you know, it's, it's more of a felt reality. So, for example, in the wake of, um, of John Henry Newman and the Oxford movement, there was a movement into the Catholic Church. Uh, and that was felt in this country here. You know, uh, I give the example that there was a rector of uh, Mount Calvary Episcopal Church in Baltimore, Maryland, the oldest Anglican church in, in Baltimore who in the wake of the Oxford movement realized his own uh, vocation was to the full communion of the church. So he gets on a boat, goes to England, meets John Henry Newman, is received into the church by John Henry Newman, comes back to Baltimore, is ordained a Catholic priest, uh, and becomes the founding bishop of um, uh, in, in Delaware, the Catholic bishop in Delaware. That parish, Mount Calvary, is now a parish of the ordinary. You know, so these things kind of come full circle. Why 2007? The funeral of Pope John Paul II. I read every dossier of clergy that were applying uh, for, to, for reception into the Catholic Church and to be ordained Catholic priest, and every single one of them, in one way or another, cited the funeral of Pope John Paul II as kind of a watershed moment. When you're watching five million people standing out there for day upon day trying to get into St. Peter's Basilica and knowing what kind of monumental figure he was in not only the life of the church, but in the history of the world. And I think I've got this all figured out. Maybe I need to look deeper into, into what is at the heart of this. And so the, the, this kind of touches off a, a direct study of the catechism of the Catholic Church and some other things. And, it, and so there's this push. But they're asking the question differently. So the question was no longer was, how do I become Catholic? It's, it becomes, however you want me to become Catholic, I'll do. But there's all these people here. They're, these are my parishioners. And this is a, a discernment. This is a conversation. This has been a study that we have embarked on together. Is there a way for us to become Catholic, for us to, to enter into the fullness of the church and the fullness of, the, of Catholic truth together. 
that preserves this relationship because I feel these you know these men writing a pastoral responsibility to my people. Can we preserve that relationship? And while we're asking, is there a way to become Catholic where we don't have to leave at the door everything of who we were? And we brought the question immediately to the Holy Father, to Pope Benedict XVI, who said, yeah, this must be studied. <laughs> And so a commission was set up, a dialogue commission was set up precisely with that, those two questions in mind. Could we preserve the pastoral relationship between the priest and his congregation? Could we acknowledge, you know, these, the, uh, the Second Vatican Council in, uh, in the document Lumen Gentium talks about elements of sanctification and truth outside of the visible communion of the Catholic Church. Can we identify some of these elements of sanctification and truth and if they're true, why wouldn't we uh, embrace them? And so what then uh, happens is a, 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 a two-year process of dialogue with Anglican bishops, Catholic bishops, with the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, where I work, kind of taking the lead. And in 2009, Pope Benedict XVI publishes a constitution called Anglicanorum Cedibus. It always sounds better in Latin. That's why we name things in Latin. Because the document literally means Anglican groups. <laughs> which doesn't sound interesting. And there he acknowledges and he articulates for the first time a new ecumenical vision, that it is possible to receive ecclesial groups, we call them parishes, but you know, ecclesial groups into the fullness of Catholic communion. So it's not like you have to join our CIA and you have to join our CIA and you have to join our CIA and then we'll see, but that the parish together with their priest, engages that catechetical formation that makes the journey together, and that their togetherness is something constitutive and important about how they're coming into the fullness of communion. Then it becomes the question of the patrimony, these elements of sanctification and truth in Anglicanism. And the, the, the line articulated by Pope Benedict XVI himself, which we, of course, immediately wrote down, uh, is this, the unity of faith allows for a vibrant diversity in faith's expression. So if we're all on the same page faith-wise, how we express that faith, how we live it, how we get language to it, can be diverse. Catholic unity does not mean uniformity. And he articulated it in this context, which is, you know, I think an important piece of the story. The Anglican bishops that we were, we were dialoguing with, moving through this process, you know, I'm hitting, you know, I work for the CDF. We were called the Inquisition one time. I'm hitting the issues, you know, divorce and remarriage and homosexuality and all of the, like the hot button issues, right? And they finally grew tired of me. Um, and so the bishops just, the, the, the Anglicans just said, look, maybe we can make this a lot easier. They had gone out at lunch and purchased from the Vatican bookstore a copy of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. They opened it and signed it. <laughs> I don't know that all the priests of the Archdiocese of San Francisco would have done that, but you know, okay, next question. And that's what we brought to the Holy Father. Yeah, okay, this is what they believe, and it's marvelous. In the catechism itself, in the, in the, um, the, 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 the apostolic constitution that promulgates the catechism, John Paul II had written right there, I never saw it, that the catechism was the basis for the ecumenical movement of the church, and there, literally, it had become. So these Anglican bishops, in a certain sense, called the question, we believe this, now what? And then that's what then uh, Pope Benedict XVI pushes us to do um, as we establish these concrete structures for these people coming in to articulate what is it about their worship? What is it about their, uh, the, the way that they have prayed, the way that they have done parish, the way that they have ministered to the poor, the way that they've understood the Christian faith and, and, and done that? 
Does it look and sound differently than what we do in Rome? Yes, probably. But if that's what brought them to the point of seeking the fullness of Catholic communion, then it would be, again, in the words of the Holy Father, terribly irresponsible of us to say, leave that all aside. So the faithful and clergy of the ordinariate have liturgical books. The, uh, the, the Office for Baptism of Infants is almost identical to what you would find in the 1662 Book of Common Prayer. Because there is nothing in there contrary to the faith. It expresses exactly what the church believes about baptism. Same thing about the order of, uh, of funerals. You know, I remember when we were working on the funeral rite for the ordinariate, the very Dominican New York Archbishop sitting next to me, Archbishop Gustinoia says, when I die, I want this, <laughs> you know, because again, there is a, there is a, there is a, there's a nobility to, to, uh, to the language of how it's being expressed there. If you were to go to an ordinary parish, if you would come down to, all of you are welcome if you're in Houston, uh, come to our Cathedral of Our Lady of Walsingham. You know, you would immediately recognize the Mass. It's Mass, but it sounds different. The idiom, the expression is a different kind of English. The, the, the postures are different. Some of the accents, therefore, are different. The music is different. You know, because this is how the Roman rite, because that's, remember, when Henry VIII split, that's what they had. They had, you know, the Roman rite was taken up and developed in English over a period of 500 years and is now brought back into the fullness of communion with the Catholic Church. And so everything that was expressive of Catholic faith remains. And so our parishes are a little different, the way that they structure themselves. Um, it's, 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 it's a more participatory form of government. I was explaining to, to Archbishop just yesterday, you know, the way that the diocese is structured is different because it's, it's meant to give uh, a nod to uh, uh, the Anglican system of, of governance. You know, that uh, is a valid system. So I govern with a council, for example, in the diocese. So the priests of my governing council vote on certain things, like the admission of a man to the priesthood, the establishment or suppression of a parish. You know, there's about five or six of these things that without that vote, I can't act. You know, and that would not be the same. That would not be the same situation in, in in many Catholic dioceses. But again, all of this is meant to express not only an ecumenical vision, but a mutual enrichment. And this is what Pope Benedict the Sixteenth had in mind: that that in acknowledging this diversity in the way that the one faith is lived and expressed, enriches the Catholic Church. Because when you come to Mass at the Ordinariate, you know, you're going to experience something different than you will in your normal parish. Now, that's not to say that when you go back to your normal parish, you're going to want to do that. But just the fact that you've heard the different accent, it's going to awaken something in you. We say it in your regular, in, in all the other diocesan parishes. But sometimes, you know, when you've said the same words over and over again, you know, you start, you start becoming a little complacent. So the fact that these communities salt and pepper, you know, the church in North America and then in the other two ordinariates, the ordinariate of Our Lady of Walsingham in England, Wales and Scotland, the ordinariate of Our Lady of the Southern Cross in Australia and the whole Pacific Rim, because they have two parishes in Japan, for example, and other places. Um, the fact that these little communities exist and that they're worshiping this way and that they're being very bold in their Catholic faith can only enrich the experience and the tapestry of, of, of Catholic worship and Catholic life. Because there are accents, you know, there is, there is something, uh, there's something that just is instinctively true about this that awakens Catholic faith. Pope Benedict XVI in articulating this, really kind of goes out on the ledge theologically. When we talk about, you know, the, the, the schism, you know, the break of the Church of England with the Roman Church, you know, and that, 
that ecclesial separation that has happened, you know, now 500 years, what he's articulating is God didn't walk away. See, they were separated from the full communion of the Catholic Church, and much of the Anglican communion still is. But the Holy Spirit, nevertheless, is doing something. We can recognize it in the authenticity of these prayers, in the authenticity of the preaching of the gospel, in the authenticity of service to the poor. You know, we can recognize that there as precisely a fruit of the Holy Spirit's working. And so if that working has led these communities now to ask for the fullness of Catholic communion, you know, there, there, there's, no, there's no threat to the church to be generous. There's no threat to the church that would motivate us to say, as we did prior, just go to our CIA and become a Catholic like everybody else. But that there's actually something that can be raised up that, that not only nurtures the faith of these folks, but that awakens the faith of the rest of the church. So that's kind of what I do. Um, I am not myself. Uh, I have never been an Anglican. You know, I, in fact, will honestly tell you, as I've said to my own clergy, all of whom, uh, I'm the only Roman born, if you will, in the diocese at this point. Um, I think when I went to work in Rome in 2005, I couldn't even tell you that I met, uh, I had met an Anglican. Um, so all of this has kind of come very directly for me as a work of the Holy Spirit. But um, it's nevertheless for me a tremendous privilege uh, to be with this community of people and to understand that the, the fullness of communion, that which is true, is worth putting your life on the line for. It's worth the challenge and the hardship of leaving your parish and of trying to form something new. And for the clergy, for the priests, it's not just leaving your parish, it's leaving your well, your salary, your insurance, your retirement, and your house. Oh, and by the way, you're married with kids. You know, and just kind of walking out in faith, uh, trusting that God and the church are going to take care of you because it's true. And so there is an eloquence to that testimony of faith. I think that's on, in the heart of it. So it's an ecumenical adventure, certainly, because it says to all the world that's not Catholic, to become Catholic means you don't have to check everything of who you are at the door, but that there's, there are gifts that can be brought in and shared with the whole church. And it's a testimony to the people within the church that faith matters and ecclesial life matters. Discipleship matters. And if you put it all on the line, God is just going to bless that richly with his grace. There we go. 20 minutes, just as I was told. <laughs> So we'd welcome uh, some questions for Bishop Lopes. I think uh, Deacon Goldsworthy had his hand up first. All right, very good. His, his questions are always super easy. Okay. <laughs> I'm sure that's not true. How many um, people of the Anglican faith have come into the church since 2007? Well, let's see. Um, I can only answer that question within the ordinary itself, you know, I mean, because plenty of people come into the church through our CIA and everything. Okay, so since 2007 in North America, because I don't know that I have the numbers right for, Italy, for England and Australia, we have ordained 74 priests, all of whom were former Anglican ministers. I think, you know, around the diocese right now, we probably have, you know, on a given Sunday in our very, we have 42 parish communities that account for about 20,000 people at Mass. How many of them are actual, uh, you know, converts or actual people who come into full communion? About two thirds, you know, and the last third are are cradle Catholics who have who have been awakened to their faith through this reality, or who have come back, who had fallen away from the church, and have come back to their faith through the ordinary and its uh, and its evangelizing effort. Do you know Bishop Michael? I do. Yes. <laughs> Pray for him. He's very sick. Very sick. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
I have, by the way, among my priests, among the 74, five former bishops in the, uh, in the uh, Anglican and Episcopal Church. Yeah. So what does it look like when a whole parish joins together to confess? I mean, what happened prior to that? Yeah, I mean, that, was, that, that experience was more at the beginning. Uh, you'd have usually what would happen. Um, I got a frantic phone call from uh, the Archbishop of Louisville. And I said, and he said, I need your help. There's all these people have just shown up. I said, well, <laughs> what are they doing? Well, they went to mass. Okay, so it's not a protest. Now, <laughs> say more. Well, like 30 people walked in with their priests and they just took a pew. And now they're asking what to do. I, okay, well, thank you. I will send my vicar general up, but in the meantime, could you appoint one of your priests as catechist? You know, and so one of the local diocesan priests would usually work with the community. At the beginning, we would try to do it, uh, coincide it with Lent, um, because there's a certain point when you're dealing with a parish community, they have to stop being Anglicans in order to become Catholics. And so there's a period of Eucharistic fast. And we would do that during, uh, during Lent usually, where at Lent they would be having, um, they, would be ha they would go to Mass, but they couldn't receive the Eucharist. They would be going into intense catechesis and whatever. Usually what we would try to do is receive the priest into full communion on Holy Thursday so that he could participate in receiving his parishioners into full communion at the Easter Vigil. And then we would do intense formation um, with the priest. It's a minimum, what is required as a minimum for the priest is two years of formation. But the question is, where do you situate ordination in that two years? If the priest is coming in just on his own, it would be at the end of the two years. If the priest is actively bringing in a parish, it would be at the beginning of those two years because someone got to take care of that community. That's that essential relationship between the parish and the, um, and the, uh, and the community. You know, fast forward three years to where we are today, it's much rarer for an entire parish to vote and, and come in. For one thing, uh, people are really tied to their real estate, you know? I mean, this is the not, and I don't say that glibly, I mean that this is where mom and dad were, were married, and this is maybe where I was baptized and whatnot. To become Catholic, you lose everything. Now, there are certain circumstances, I can think of three of our parishes, where we were able to purchase the buildings off of the local Episcopal diocese. Um, generally speaking, the more liberal the bishop, the easier that is, because it's, you know, sure, go ahead. Um, but, you know, if you have to leave everything, that fractures a community. So what we normally have happen now is like 25 people will leave. That doesn't sound much. But you can't think like Catholics. The average size of a Protestant, a mainline Protestant community, you know, Methodist, Lutheran, Presbyterian, Episcopalian, the average size of a mainline Protestant parish in the United States is 150 people. People. We count family. They count, you know, uh, people. So, you know, when you have 25, 30, 50 people step out, I mean, that's a major percentage of that. Uh, congregation. Now you're starting new. You're starting from from scratch, and so it's it's in, in, again in more of a classically Protestant terminology. Now you're dealing with a church plant. So you know, and and as the bishop, I'm constantly dealing with the cart and horse issue. There, they need a priest in order to gather and grow that community into a Catholic reality. In order to send a priest, you have enough. You have to have enough people. So, you know, the man can feed himself and his family somewhat. And so I'm, I'm you know, I'm good at bartering because I'm, I'm doing this thing now where I have to go to the local diocesan bishop and say, all right, can we arrange a thing where maybe he's going to work 75% of the time for you, 25% of the time for me, do this. And as the community grows, you shift the percentage and whatnot. That's my life. You know, uh, it's, it's, it's not as cut and dry as the parish comes in, oh yeah, and here are the buildings. Sometimes, but that's rarer. Is, is there a process, it strikes me, we're still in the first generation. Yeah, right? very much is, so. Is there a process where a young man coming up and comes over with his parents and he's going to please for the ordinary? 
Absolutely. Absolutely. So right now in formation, I have five uh, former Anglican priests, most of them young men in their 30s, uh, who have become Catholic and are in formation for Catholic priesthood. These are married men uh, who were ordained Anglican clergy. At the same time, I have eight seminarians uh, in preparation for priesthood. These are young men, boys, from our parishes who discern a vocation to priesthood and enter the seminary. Now, they are celibate, you know, because we're Catholics now, you know, and that's the rule. In order to, to receive this dispensation, the dispensation in order to have a married priest is reserved only for those who are ordained as Anglicans. And even that's after a, a, a vetting process, which is ultimately not my decision. All of that has to go to the Holy See. In each and every case, it's the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith doing the vetting, if you will. Um, so there are those two streams uh, of, incoming, of incoming clergy. You know, the, the continued interest we receive from uh, current Anglican clergy it is not an exaggeration to say, I asked my formation and vocations director yesterday, just so I'd have the number, we get about three phone calls a week uh, from currently serving Anglican clergy. And then, you know, our vocational interest with our young men, which frankly, I put more emphasis on, you know, because that's the sign of life, <laughs> that these communities are not just coming in, but that they're then also producing vocations, you know, that's, that's, uh, that's a tremendous sign of God's grace. Yeah, I've got some at St. Mary's Seminary in Houston. Uh, the college boys are at St. Ben's in Louisiana, and I'll have two at the North American College in Rome. They're just, they go to the same seminary thing, and then we focus with them on su in summers on formation in particularly the Anglican patrimony that's at the heart of our, our experiences, our diocese. Is there a similar uh, ordinariate for other well, uh, when I was working in Rome, Archbishop de Noia and I again got sent up to Sweden precisely to, to look at that, uh, a possibility of an ordinariate for uh, the, the Lutheran Church of Sweden. Swedish Church is its own thing, as most of the Nordic churches are. They're Lutheran doctrinally, but they never were never ever Calvinist, so there's much more of a Catholic ethos to them. They still have dioceses, they still wear vestments at Mass, you know, these kinds of things. It's harder um, because of the, of the established church thing. Even though Swed the Church of Sweden has been for, what now, maybe 13 years, disestablished as the national church, that hangs on culturally in, in a very big way. Um, so that's a, that's a particular challenge there. Then, frankly, there's also the challenge of of what particularity um, is there to a, a, a patrimony that becomes the identity of, the, of, of a diocese, which is what we are. So in our thing, we have a particular way of celebrating Mass. You can look at the 1554, 1552, 1662 Books of Common Prayer, and you can see exactly where our celebration of Mass comes from. Not so much among Lutherans. You know, that vacillates between this and that and the other thing. So is there enough diversity there to, to give it its own identity. In Sweden, we decided and discovered probably not. So what we did was the earlier model in that we, there, there would be certain clergy who came into full communion with their parishioners, and uh, there's only one Catholic bishop in all of Sweden. Remember, the, the Catholic Church in Sweden was illegal until 1954. Uh, so these were established then as parishes within the, di the Catholic Diocese of Stockholm. And they're given certain attention. I think we gave them permission to use a particular translation of the Bible, um, the hymnal that, that they, they knew very well. And honestly, they didn't ask for more than that um, at this point. So those, those communities are existing uh, kind of as the way that it did in the 80s and early 90s in this country, maybe one day that develops into something else. I don't know. But beyond the churches in the Nordic countries, you'd be hard pressed in, in certainly mainline Protestantism, well, evangelical Protestantism even more, 
to find that Catholic root, to, to find that thing. I mean, plenty of these folks come into full communion with the Catholic Church, but to do it as a body, as a group, means you're, 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 you're drawing from a tradition, you're drawing from uh, an, an experience of Catholic life that has somehow informed. That's true. That's always been true about Anglicanism. Not so much about Presbyterianism. Or Lutheranism, you know, that these things are much more in counterpoint to to the Catholic experience. Yeah. Go ahead. Right. Sure. 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 A lot of it, honestly, is is a recover of a recovery of devotional life. I mean. The treasury of, of devotional life in the Catholic Church, a lot of it is developed in English originally. You know, so things like processions, hymns, litanies, pilgrimages, you know, ways of praying the rosary, the chaplet of the precious blood, the chaplet of the five wounds, which is an original uh, English devotion that didn't exist anywhere else in the world. These things, you know, that inform the fundamental experience of the patrimony which is the domestic church. This you would, if you come to an ordinary parish, you will hear the domestic church talked about all the time. The church of the family that worships together on Sundays. You know, and that, that what has to do, was happening on Sunday is being nurtured and nourished in the domestic church. You know, and that, that influences education, that influences the way we teach our kids, that influences the fact that morning and evening prayer said as a family is a thing you know, and, and, and that kind of devotional life, that's really the personal patrimony. We are trying to, 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 to promote that, but the fact of the matter is uh, a lot of these resources, you know, no longer exist. You know, like in England, the Church of England, well, that's a lot of that's kind of passe, you know. So I'm very pleased, you know, Anglicans of a certain age will remember the old St. Augustine prayer book and, and, and things like this. We are republishing that. Uh, and actually, the book should be out at the end of this month. Ignatius Press is putting out the St. Gregory Prayer Book. And the St. Gre Gregory Prayer Book would be for that staple of devotional life in the family. Um, and it would have everything from the Mass, our Mass in there, all the way through. Newman, Stations of the Cross, you name it, we got it. Um, as a way of recovering patrimony because most of those prayers will now be available nowhere else in English, at least in print form. You can bump along and find some of them on the internet. But the devotions to Our Lady of Walsingham. Walsingham was not only the principal uh, place of pilgrimage in England, it was the third, you know, after Rome, after the Holy Land, Rome, Santiago, it was the fourth largest pilgrimage site in, in the medieval world. You know, and to recover all of the devotion that goes with uh, Our Lady of Walsingham and then the five wounds, you know, that doesn't exist anywhere else. One more. One more. Uh, question, what, uh, what can 500 years of liturgical language in English, what can Anglicans teach our 50 years of the vernacular for, in terms of liturgical language and style? Sure. Sure. The question is, what is 500 years of liturgical language in English what could that teach 50 years of, of mass in the vernacular? Um, two things immediately come to mind, you know, again, as someone who is himself new to all of this. It, without a doubt, without a question, without a hair's breadth of a question, the new translation of the Roman Missal is infinitely superior to the previous translation of the sacramentary, which in places reads like, it was put together by a committee of psychologists and not, you know, this is no longer what the Roman church has been praying for, you know, 1500 years. This is now something different. So the new translation is infinitely superior. It is still Latin in its syntax, which is why it, it sent your priests kind of skidding off the rails when it, when it first came out. Verb, the verb, where's the verb, where's the verb? And it's at the end of the sentence, you know, kind of thing. I have more than once gotten lost in a collect or in the prefaces, particularly, and 
especially if you're singing the preface and not paying attention so much to the words. You miss a word, man, you are done for in this thing. <laughs> What you have that arises out of the prayer book tradition of, uh, you know, so 1549 and forward is the liturgy with its sarum root. So the sarum liturgy, which was approved by Rome, particularly for England, but in Latin, being rendered in original English. The syntax is English. It sounds like English. I know where the verb is. And when you're, when you're sight singing it, and there's no notes on these things, you know, you're just chanting the prayers. By the punctuation in the colic, I know where to move my voice. You know, so there's, there's, a, there's a more natural thing. So even though we use hieratic English, sac sacral English, thee and thou and, you know, this, that and the other thing, um, I find our liturgy easier to pray out loud publicly. I'm not getting tongue tied as much. So syntax is a part of it. The second thing is hieratic English, that what the Anglican liturgical experience has preserved is English different than what you hear in the marketplace. So people call it Shakespearean English. It isn't. It's actually the opposite of Shakespeare, because Shakespeare was writing in the language of the people. Mass was elevated. And not only is it elevated in terms of its rhetoric, it also preserves these marvelous distinctions that our English has lost. So thee and thou versus you and your. This is informal speech. This is formal speech. English used to have the tu and the usted, like Spanish does. So you always speak to God in the form, in the informal because that's how Christ taught us to call Father. When the priest speaks to the people, he speaks in the formal. So it's still, lift the Lord be with you, the priest saying it to the congregation, and with thy spirit, you know, the people addressing the priest. There's a singular plural, and a, a, so that, that kind of relational understanding of language, um, I think is important. And then there are certain words in English that aren't Latin, you know, so there's a vocabulary uh, that kind of informs the whole thing, you know, and sometimes we've had to change, we had to, to shift the vocabulary. I gave Archbishop the example uh, this morning, you know, the word prevent in English no longer means what it meant. So when I say, prevent us, O Lord, by thy grace, what do you think? From what? Well, see, that word has shifted. Prevent means go before, precede. The, God's, the idea that God's grace is there well before we get there, you know, and it's waiting for us. So go before us, O oh Lord. So we sometimes have to modernize the language. But there are other examples throughout the Missal of words that don't, that didn't get, you know, that are not Latin based. And so they, they, they atonement. Some of you have mentioned to me, you have, you've been to Our Lady of the Atonement in San Antonio, and that is an example of a word that's not Latin-based, but it expresses something about the mystery of salvation um, that is uniquely English. So there's that too. There we go. Thank you. This is the way that we uh, end every one of our liturgies. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. The peace of God, which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Amen.